Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Total Annihilation Kingdoms for PC. I'm also including the expansion pack, The Iron Plague, in this review. This is a real-time strategy game developed by Cave Dog Entertainment and originally released in 1999 for PC exclusively. The Iron Plague expansion followed up in March of the following year, 2000, and that was the last title that Cave Dog released before they ended up shutting down. It's also a sequel of sorts to the original Total Annihilation, although it's really a sequel in name and general gameplay style only. While the previous game is a sci-fi title with only two factions, this one has four factions, five if you count the Iron Plague, and it takes place in a fantasy setting. And it wasn't anywhere near as well received as the previous game in the series, both by critics of the time and, of course, by fans of the series. Which, of course, begs the question of why the fans of the original just didn't latch onto it, and in fact are, in many cases, outright hostile towards it. How could public sentiment turn so heavily against Total Annihilation Kingdoms when it turned so positively toward the original Total Annihilation? Well, let's go ahead and delve right into this thing and find out. Well, as far as presentation goes, you do have to keep a couple of things in mind. First off, this was extremely impressive in 1999 as far as its visuals go. By today's standards, it looks incredibly archaic. This is part of what I like to call the first wave of 3D strategy games, where they used 3D visuals for some of the first time you would see in gaming. And that came with both benefits and detriments. The main of these benefits is that it was pretty impressive to look at. Now, by today's standards it looks pretty terrible, but at the time, this level of modeling and animation quality in a strategy game was very, very impressive. Unfortunately, that's pretty much where the benefits of it being a 3D real-time strategy game circa 1999 end, because the main downside is that this game ran like complete garbage when it launched. Most people of the time just did not have the hardware to actually run this thing very well, and it ended up being a pretty major detriment for a lot of people at that time as a result. And by the time more and more people were adopting hardware that could run it really well, it was long past its prime. That's something you have to keep in mind if you're playing this thing with a modern mindset, because at the time, you didn't have this sort of very incremental change going on with visuals and physics simulation and things like that. Computing technology in the late 90s and early 2000s was going forward at a ridiculously fast pace, and it wasn't until basically the mid-2000s that it started to mellow out a bit, until you get to the modern situation where we get really excited over something being in 4K, which is basically just, oh hey, it's higher resolution than what we have now, but it's the same kind of games. Now with all of that out of the way, Total Annihilation and Total Annihilation Kingdoms really do not benefit very well from being 3D games. Yes, they're visually impressive for their time, but they have aged extremely poorly in terms of visuals. And on top of that, since they're very early 3D strategy games, they really don't make very good use of 3D graphics. Everything takes place from a top-down perspective, and I do mean top-down, it's not even isometric. So you can't really mess around with the camera to get a better view of what's happening or anything of that nature. It's all from one perspective, and that actually can cause some problems with the backgrounds. You see, even though the character models and the buildings and all that are in 3D, the actual backgrounds are all in 2D. Meaning that elevation can sometimes be pretty tricky to figure out, and it's also kind of tricky to figure out what objects on the terrain are impassable versus others. And for example, if you want to remove a tree or something along those lines from the environment so you can actually place a building there, then sometimes it's a bit tricky to actually get the cursor to say, oh hey, this is actually where the tree is. You can, of course, muddle through it, but it ends up being something of a mess. What's a bit less of a mess is the sound design. You have voice acting that is all right, it's basically just a bunch of unit callouts and there's not really much to it. So for what it is, it ends up working out pretty well. The problem is the actual sound quality. The sound effects and the voice acting both suffer from the same problem in that regard, where the sound quality is a bit grainy and rather archaic by modern standards. Thus, you have a problem where both the sound effects and the voice acting end up sounding like they're coming through a tin can rather than an actual sound chip. But like the voice acting, the sound effects are workable. They do their job and they do it reasonably well for the time, so there's not really too much to complain about there other than the simple fact that the sound quality is rather old and it's not really all that good. 
Of course, that's even from standards of 1999, because by that point, they had actually kind of figured out how to do video game sound effects, and you had much better sounding games by that point. But there is one saving grace to the sound design, and that is the soundtrack, which was done by Jeremy Sewell, who of course did the soundtrack for the previous Total Annihilation game as well, and it is fairly standard fantasy music. Don't get me wrong, it's very well composed music, and it actually works out rather well for the game in the long run, but there's really nothing all that special about the soundtrack for this one. But of course, it's not all about presentation. What really matter here are the story and the gameplay. The story in this is considerably more involved than the story was in the previous Total Annihilation game. And to that end, they've got a very lengthy single player campaign that will keep you busy for quite a while, even though some of the missions are longer than others, of course. And the basic story is that you play as the four monarchs of the various factions that are vying for control of the land of Darien. Those monarchs are Elsin, who rules the lands of Aramon, Thersha, who rules the lands of Zaun, Lochan, who rules the lands of Taros, and finally Karenna, who rules the lands of Varuna. And their father, Garakaius, basically leaves the lands of Darien to them and just kind of vanishes. And so they start ruling after their own lands and eventually end up embroiled in a massive conflict between the four factions. It all kicks off when Taros invades Aramon and ends up dragging the entirety of the lands of Darien into a massive conflict. And over the course of the campaign, you will be going back and forth between the perspectives of the various factions as they vie for control of Darien. And unlike in the previous Total Annihilation, they actually put quite a lot of emphasis on the story and the storytelling in this. The thing is that it tends to drag on for way too long. There are quite a few points throughout the campaign where everything just starts dragging on and on on and on, and you just gradually lose interest. It really doesn't help that the vast majority of the storytelling is done through some rather static cutscenes that look like they would be right at home in a documentary. A lot of paintings fading in and out while narration goes over them and you hear quotes from various characters throughout the game. It definitely sets the presentation of the campaign apart from other RTS campaigns, but at the same time, it's a pretty boring way to tell a story. Even worse, the story doesn't really justify it dragging out for so long because it really isn't that great of a story. It generally just tries way too hard to be quote unquote epic and what you end up with is a story that just ends up falling flat on its face. This is a trend that mostly continues with the Iron Plague expansion where it becomes revealed that the reason that gunpowder exists in the lands of Darien is because it was basically given to them by the lands of Creon. You see, it turns out that when Garakaius disappeared, he had actually used his immense magical powers, because he was the Mage Emperor of Darien, to basically make himself mortal again. He then just hopped in a boat and went as far as he could away from Darien, only to find the lands of Creon. And he had ultimately decided that magic was more trouble than it's worth. He had seen what it had done to the lands of Darien and decided, you know what, we're not going to have that anymore. Creon is going to be a land of science and reason. And so he basically turned Creon into a steampunk empire. So when you fast forward to the more modern era, you have an extremely powerful Creon that basically leases its gunpowder to the lands of Darien so that they can beat back the Tarosian hordes. And Elson of Aramon fully intends to pay them for this, so he gets a gold shipment together and sends it off to Creon who never receives the shipment because it was taken by pirates. And thus, when Varuna sends ships to investigate, they find that Creon had also sent ships to investigate, and in the confusion, they end up opening fire on each other. Thus starts yet another massive war between the various factions, only this time you now have a fifth faction in the mix, Creon. And at least as far as the writing in the campaign goes, they would have you believe that Creon is basically an unstoppable juggernaut of fire and steel that is pretty much just completely sweeping over the lands of Darien. And like in the base campaign, you do play as multiple factions throughout the course of the campaign, and it gives you different perspectives and is done in the same exact style as far as its storytelling goes. This means that the story is told through a bunch of cutscenes that are done in a sort of documentary style with a lot of quotes from various characters throughout the course of the game and explanations of what they're doing and why they were doing it. The thing is, it's a bit easier to tolerate it with the Iron Plague expansion because the Iron Plague expansion is just simply shorter than the base game is. It's still a pretty lengthy campaign, don't get me wrong, it's just that it's definitely quite a bit shorter than the base game's campaign, so it doesn't feel like it drags on quite as much. 
That said, the storytelling is still boring as hell and the story ends up falling on its face more often than not. I mean, it starts off pretty strong with the idea that this war is started by something that's actually very believable and then the further on you get into the campaign, the more kind of mwahahaha villain Creon gets. They are completely fanatical in their devotion to science and reason, and it's to the expense of anyone who believes in magic. As in, they want to completely exterminate it. Talk about escalating quickly. But that's something that the campaign itself doesn't really do. It doesn't escalate quickly, it escalates as a sort of slow burn, much like the base game was. And since both games suffer from the same issues in terms of the storytelling, it ends up really falling to the gameplay to bring things up. And what you have here is basically the original Total Annihilation, but with some pretty heavy tweaking. There are two major changes in particular. First off, instead of getting two factions, which play almost identically, you get four factions, five if you count the Iron Plague expansion, all of which have very, very different units with their own individual playstyles. The second major difference is that, unlike in the original Total Annihilation, there is only one resource, and that is mana. Like in the original game, however, it is generated by building various structures at various points throughout the map so you can generate more mana. This is done at a trickle rate instead of, say, mining for resources or something like that in any other RTS. This does keep things pretty simple. It also means that the vast majority of the strategy is going to be finding ways to defend your various mana points throughout the map and to, of course, control as many as you possibly can. And that's kind of where the strategy ends because pretty much every faction has one strategy that you can use to win. And all that really boils down to is churn out a crap ton of units and then overwhelm the enemy with just plain old numbers. You can try to build towers, and in particular the Bastion and Stronghold are capable of dishing out quite a lot of pain to the various units in the game, but all that really does is force the enemy to use a bit more siege weaponry, which is extremely powerful both against units and against buildings, but it's considerably more powerful against buildings because it can actually hit them. The reason for that is that the projectiles from the various siege weapons tend to take a while to actually reach their destination, so you can launch one and then it's where the enemy was but is no longer. And that's basically how every single match goes. You just hop in there, you create a bunch of units, you charge in, you overwhelm the enemy with sheer numbers, and you just wipe them out. Sometimes you'll get lucky and the enemy monarch will just start wandering around outside of the base and you can just run up to them and smack them around a bit until eventually they go down. Because if they go down in the standard rules, then the person who lost their monarch instantly loses the match. Either way, you're still going to need a fair few units to do that because Monarchs themselves are incredibly powerful. They each get three different attack abilities, one of which is a sort of wave-based attack that goes out in a large radius. And they're pretty tough when you actually go up against them, so that's something else to keep in mind. Of course, it's also worth noting that the various Monarchs each have their own special abilities as well. Elsin, for example, can resurrect things. Thersha can fly. Lachan can turn invisible. And Karenna can actually move on water. Elson's resurrection ability is particularly powerful because that means he can resurrect builder units from other factions and then get access to all of the buildings and units that they can produce. You may think that adds a layer of strategy to the game, but it really doesn't because you're really not going to be too focused on building units from other factions no matter what faction you're actually playing. Sure, there are abilities and units in the game that will allow you to do that, but you're really more focused on utilizing your own faction's strengths in order to come out on top. And to that end, each faction has basically a couple of units that you're just going to be constantly spamming. For example, Varuna gets Berserkers, which are extremely fast, rather powerful infantry. Then, of course, Aramon gets Mage Archers, which are the most powerful archer unit in the entire game, and so on and so forth. Every faction has their own units that you're going to be constantly relying on, and it really just becomes a matter of churn out as many of those as you possibly can, and just go in and overwhelm the enemy with firepower. And the game really does encourage you to be hyper-aggressive, too, because you can churn out a lot of units really quickly, and it really doesn't matter that you only have one resource because it replenishes pretty quickly, and even if it's not replenished, you can still build things even when your mana is at zero. 
And the only real downside of that is that it seems to take a bit longer to actually produce whatever it is you're producing if you have no mana. Granted, in a game like this where you're going to be having to constantly churn out tons and tons and tons of units to meet with the demand for just annihilating your opponents, well, that's actually a pretty big deal. But here's the thing. Even though each faction does have its own perks and detriments, even though each faction does have a set of units that are different from all of the other units in the game, even though each faction has a monarch with its own specific abilities, you're going to find that really the entire game consists of nothing but the exact same formula, which is build a bunch of towers so you can defend your base, then churn out a crap ton of your most powerful units and send them to annihilate your foes. If you're doing much more thinking than that while playing Total Annihilation Kingdoms, you're probably playing it wrong. It is a ludicrously simple real-time strategy game, but the sad thing is, it's more advanced than Total Annihilation was. The original Total Annihilation did have an extra resource, but both of the factions played almost exactly the same. There was basically no variation between them, so no matter what you were doing, you were ultimately just going to churn out a crap ton of your most powerful units, charge in, and annihilate your foes with overwhelming firepower. Kingdoms at least forces you to play differently depending on what faction you're playing. I mean, Zahn, for example, doesn't even get buildings. They get various units that then build other units, which is a bit odd to think about, but when you start to really think about the tactical implications, that means they can basically take Thersha, move anywhere they want on the map, produce a bunch of units, and then move to another portion of the map and just basically keep their enemies guessing. It's a wildly different playstyle than all the other factions, which have to build buildings in order to actually produce their their units. And because of things like that, there is more strategic depth to this than there was in the original Total Annihilation. And yet, a lot of fans of the original absolutely despise this one. So, why is that? Well, for one, it was a marked change. You went from sci-fi to fantasy. A lot of people don't like fantasy, but they like sci-fi. A lot of fans of the original thought it was being quote-unquote dumbed down by being reduced to a single resource rather than two resources. And while there is some merit to that argument, ultimately it's a pretty minimal argument because the gameplay is still almost exactly the same as it was in the original Total Annihilation, just with slightly more complexity at the cost of a resource. But really, those are things that people could work around. What they couldn't work around at the time was the incredibly poor performance the game had. Unless you had some rather high-end hardware for the time, the game pretty much just ran like crap. And it had quite a few bugs and glitches to boot, most of which was all fixed by the passage of time. Better hardware made the game, of course, run quite a bit better, and they did, of course, address some of the bugs and glitches as they went through updating the game. Eventually, they even started introducing new units to the game to spice things up a bit. That, of course, brings up a pretty major concern, which is balancing. Some people thought that Creon is incredibly overpowered. A lot of that stems from the fact that they get something called a Prism Tower, which is just straight up the best tower in the game. And it's not because it does the most damage or anything like that. No, 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 no. It's because it has an absolutely absurd range. The range on the Prism Towers is so much you could almost use them to conduct an attack on an enemy base. It's downright ridiculous that they can basically wipe out your entire army before it gets anywhere near close enough to actually dish out any damage to the enemy structures. Now, there are ways around this. You can defeat the Prism Towers as long as you attack them from a rather long range, but there's not really all that many units that can do something like that. Then again, you could always just use the tried and true tactic of completely overwhelm the enemy with sheer numbers. After all, the towers can only attack one enemy at a time, so if you send in enough units that it completely overwhelms the tower's ability to take them all out before it gets knocked down, well, then you've solved the problem. But yes, there are definitely legitimate balancing concerns. This game is not balanced, nor is it really meant to be. But here's the thing. You'll see a lot of people acting like the original Total Annihilation in particular is some masterpiece of RTS gameplay. It's not. Nor is Total Annihilation Kingdoms. It's an artifact of its time. It was trying to be technically impressive, but beyond that, it's a barebones strategy game. And even when you compare it to other strategy games released that year, it was still feeling rather archaic by that point. I mean, 1999 was the year that Homeworld came out. Hell, it was the same year that the first Warlords Battle Cry came out. It was the same year of Age of Empires 2. There were just these giants in the RTS genre at the time that were completely eclipsing this thing. And that really points out a major flaw of both the original Total Annihilation and Total Annihilation Kingdoms, but more so the original Total Annihilation. 
the original game was impressive for 1997. Because at that time, 3D strategy games weren't even a thing. We really didn't care how bare bones they were back in 1997, just the game being in 3D was incredibly impressive. That doesn't fly quite as much when you hit 1999, because by that point, 3D strategy games were a thing, it's just that they weren't much of a thing. We really wanted more innovation, we wanted something that was different, we wanted something that actually took advantage of 3D graphics as opposed to just being basically more of the same kind of stuff we saw back in the early 90s. Because let's face it, something like Total Annihilation is really not very far removed from the earliest Command & Conquer games. Both of the Total Annihilation games are very, very simple, and they do not stand the test of time. They're definitely interesting as far as the history of gaming goes. And while Total Annihilation Kingdoms is definitely a more advanced game than the original Total Annihilation, I really can't recommend it. I can't recommend either one of them. They just feel positively archaic. And even when I played these back in the day, yes, I actually played both of the Total Annihilation games back in the day, they really weren't all that impressive other than the technical aspects. By that point, I was playing the living crap out of the Age of Empires games, and they're just flat out better RTSs than these are. And really, that's the big problem. This is interesting as a historical relic, nothing more. If for some reason you actually do want to play this, I will have a link in the video description box where you can pick this up on GOG. It does include the Iron Plague expansion pack, and it is patched to the most up-to-date version and does run extremely well on modern hardware. But as I said before, I really can't recommend it. Thanks for watching.